Move on to the next section. The section will be in English, presented by Mr. Sterling. He is an epidemiologist and also be a coordinator for EAD search projects. Today, he will talk about pathogen discovery technology next generations about multiplex serology assay. If we are all ready, please welcome Mr. Sterling. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to apologize, I, I don't speak Thai very well, so this is going to be in English. Um, as P. Vim introduced me, I am an epidemiologist from the Uniform Services University. I am uh, here as a visiting scientist in uh, Dr. Superporn and Dr. Opus's lab um, as part of the EID search uh, project. Um, my main interests in the research are uh, the behavioral conditions that are and the environmental conditions that lead to viral spillover from wildlife and domestic animals into humans. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about uh, multiplex immunoassays. So I need to first start off by saying that the views expressed in this presentation are my own and are in no way representative, or no way necessarily representative of the organizations that I'm affiliated with. Um, so what is serology? We use serology to uh, look for antibodies in your serum. Um, typically in a diagnostic setting, we're gonna be speaking about ELISAs or enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. Um, you'll use ELISAs for influenza diagnosis, for HIV, for Zika, for Lyme's disease. Um, the bottom left, is there a laser pointer? Um, the bottom left image is your typical ELISA. This is an indirect ELISA. You have, um, on a plate, you have the antigen or the target of interest that you're looking for. You incubate that with serum from somebody. You detect that serum with a secondary antibody conjugate, and then you develop that, and the result looks right here where the change in color is measured and that indicates the presence of antibody with the more intense the color change, change the, the, the higher level of antibodies. So you might be thinking, we have PCR diagnostics, why do you care about serology? And it's a good point. If someone comes and presents to a clinic and they are sick, then they will have virus or bacteria and you'll be able to, you should be able to diagnose with PCR as long as you have the correct primers. But in the, the events of community surveillance or if you're dealing with wildlife, you might not necessarily have someone presenting with thyremia when you're in, in, investigating a, a disease outbreak. So we look for antibodies because they are relatively more long-lived than virus or bacteria in, in, in the body. Um, in acute instances, you can look for IgM antibodies, which peak roughly 15 days after exposure, and IgG can last for months if you're talking about COVID or up to years. So one of the big downsides with serology is there's degrees of cross-reactivity. So if you have an antibody raised against a specific antigen, it might recognize multiple antigens that are structurally related or structurally similar. So something like dengue, this, the four different serotypes, and Zika, HIV, one and two. So imagine having four different antigens that have the same 3D structure. You have an antibody that was raised against the first antigen, but it combined to the second and the third and the fourth, all from the same site, just because of similar structures of that protein. If you run an ELISA with each of these proteins, you'd be running four separate plates, and you still might not be able to differentiate between the antigen of exposure. For treatment, that might not be that important. If you have dengue one or dengue four, it's not gonna matter what you're treating it with. But if you're investigating a new virus or a new exposure, it's gonna be very, very confusing. So the solution around that is this Luminex XMAC technology. So these are all microsphere beads. They're about five micrometers in diameter. Um, we have 
on one axis, you have 10 unique infrared dye concentrations, and then the other axis, you have visible light dye um, concentrations. So that gives you 100 different bead regions that you can possibly use in this assay. So 100 different antigens. Um, on the bottom right here, we have uh, capture antibodies, which are used um, in most of the commercial kits, but if you want to make your own assay, it, it might not be the same technique as this. Um, but using all of these beads, instead of having one antigen per, per well per plate, you can put all of the beads in the same well and reduce the amount of plates that you're using. So like I said, there's plenty of commercial XMAP, XMAP kits. Um, right now there was close to 1,400 kits listed on the Luminex website. Um, most of them were cytokine and chemokine panels. There's some isotyping, genotoxicity, biomarkers, hormones, etc. cetera. Um, and the two common available antibody kits are a SARS-2 and human coronavirus multiplex and a SARS-2 surrogate neutralization test. So if you want to compare the two assays head to head, in ELISA you can only target one antigen per well. For the, the multiplex immunoassay, it's up to 100 per well. Um, I've never gotten close to that high, but it's, it's theoretically possible. Um, for the commercial ELISA kits, it's estimated around $8 per sample for testing. It's uh, relatively cheaper in the multiplex testing, um, with the caveat that the more, sam or more uh, targets you want to include, that price will increase, but the relative price decreases. Um, it's a comparable amount of protein per well. You can do the same types of assays between the ELISA and the multiplex immunoassay. The dynamic range for the multiplex immunoassay is up to five logs, which is significantly higher. Um, with the newer instruments, that dynamic range increases. Um, and the IG detection as well, for an ELISA, you only have, you can only target a single um, antibody, whereas with the multiplex amino assay on the, the newer instruments, you could target multiple analytes. So you could look for IgG and IgM in the same sample at the same time. So I'm going to walk through the, the three concepts that we use when we're developing our, our home brewed assays. Um, you want to use the antigens of your target species that capture reactive antibodies. So you have this bead, you conjugate your target antigen to your bead, you will incubate with a primary antibody, and then you detect it with that second antibody, the secondary antibody. Now there's multiple of the same protein coupled to these beads, so you have a direct intensity of this green light and it's directly proportional to the amount of antibodies that are bound to that protein on your bead. The second concept that we use is you want to include antigens of closely related species to target the cross-reactive and nonspecific antibodies. So on the left, we still have the same bead that we had used before with the same antigen, but bead number 27 here, we have a closely related but not the same target. We have a cross-reactive antibody here that binds to both and they both will be given antibody readings on, on the, the machine. Whereas if in the same instance you have a non-specific antibody from your serum, it might bind the non-target antigen and it won't bind your target antigen. So then you'll get a reading for bead 27 but not your target bead. The third concept is what requires the most prior serum banking you want to use um, PCR positive and PCR negative samples to quantify and find optimum dilutions for your assay. So if you saturate your assay with a very high diluted serum, you might get cross reactivity for every bead that you test and the results will not be interp interpretable. So you would dilute that down so you can maximize the sensitivity where you are able to correctly identify your positives and the specificity so you can correctly identify negative samples. And you need this dilution so that you can maximize the competition between antigens to suck up a limited amount of antibody in your serum. So I'm gonna walk through a quick example. Um, during the SARS-2 emergence in 2020, um, we developed a multiplex assay. 
so, uh, to differentiate between SARS-CoV-2 natural and vaccine-induced immunity and the common seasonal coronavirus. Um, on the left here is uh, my boss, Eric Lang, and on the right is his mentor, uh, Chris Broder. So we were not sure which approach we should use. We, we selected three different variants that could possibly give us the, the, the best resulting data. So the first assay we had chosen was um, just beta coronaviridae. So we included the SARS-CoV-2 spike and RBD antigens, uh, the SARS-1 spike, the MERS spike, the HKU1 spike, and the OC43 spike. The next was just a SARS-2 and human coronavirus uh, multiplex, including the SARS-CoV-2 spike, the HKU1 spike, the OC43 spike, and the NL63 spike. And then the last was just a SARS-2 and uh, spike in nucleoprotein uh, assay. We additionally had three clinical cohorts we used to test the assay out on. The first was an acu acute respiratory cohort, which represents our negative cohort. This included infections of um, people that had previously had rhinoviruses and the four human coronaviruses from 2012 to 2018 to, to make sure that we were not accidentally capturing any SARS-CoV-2 infections. The second cohort was uh, EPIC, that's the name of the project, the mixed cohort. Um, this was post-COVID-19, so we had SARS-2 uh, PCR confirmed, non-SARS-2 respiratory infections, and asymptomatic, but SARS-2 exposed and SARS-2 likely. And then we had a third JMS positive uh, cohort that was all uh, hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Uh, when we first looked at just background cross-reactivity in that first ARIC cohort, we found a pretty significant degree of cross background binding to SARS-CoV-2. So we needed to use this uh, cohort to account for this background binding so we can establish cutoffs to distinguish between prior infection and SARS-CoV-2 infection. So um, for the spike and the nucleoprotein, there was uh, more background binding in the convalescence era than there was in the acute phase, which is interesting. Interestingly, the acute in, uh, stage of the infection had higher background um, for HKU1 and OC43 PCR confirmed patients. So when, once we had established this, we, or once we ran these plates, we established the specificity and sensitivity calculations um, using the, the SARS-CoV-2 human coronavirus assay. Um, we were able to correctly identify um, 94% of the um, PCR confirmed patients, and then we were able to accurately uh, confirm negative 100% uh, of the negative samples. Um, and so you can see in the, within this cohort, there were two people that were just on the, the cutoff, right, right at the cutoff for uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike. And then within the cohort of mixed, um, mostly minor infections, you had a varying degree of antibody response. Um, and then within the hospitalized patients, you had very severe, uh, very significant antibody reactivity and very strong readings. And then these figures here on the right um, show the background uh, binding uh, or the cross-reactivity um, from SARS-CoV-2 infections um, with, within the beta coronaviridae and then less so with the other two human coronaviruses. So with this assay, you can check your response titers. Um, at the time that we developed this, we did not have a SARS-CoV-2 standard, so we did not have a direct measurement to quantify the antibodies, but we now are able to do this, and if you are developing an assay and you have a, a, quantify, a, a solution to quantify, it, it allows uh, for accounting between, or accounting for the variability between multiple plates. Um, you can also track antibody decay. So in this figure, we are comparing uh, inpatient and outpatient responses, um, showing that 
outpatient SARS-CoV-2 infections had a quicker level of antibody decay relative to the inpatients who also had a significantly higher antibody response. And with a little tweaking in the assay, you can replace your secondary reagent with a receptor of the protein and you can run a surrogate neutralization assay. So you can, uh, here we showed um, the wild type, the delta, and the Omicron uh, neutralization titers after vaccination and showing that a third Pfizer vaccination can um, significantly increase the neutralization titer for all three variants. Um, so right now, um, we have in use a Hanipavirus binding assay, a Hanipavirus neutralization assay, a filovirus binding assay, the human and SARS-2 coronavirus binding assays that were, uh, I just pre presented. We also have a bat-related coronavirus binding assay, and we are working on producing an MPOX and a related pox virus assay, an arbovirus assay, a bunyavirus assay, and a rickettsia assay. So that, that's all I have for today. I, sorry I don't have as much relative to everyone else, but I welcome any questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Mr. Sterling. First question. Um, what is the sensitivity between the ELISA and MMIA essay? Um, for this, we did not have a direct comparison. We didn't run any ELISAs in-house. Um, In general, what, what, what technique had showed higher sensitivity compared? Yeah. So be, because we have a, a higher dynamic range in the multiplex assay, you can theoretically be more sensitive and more specific. And the inclusion of cross-reactive proteins allows for accounting for the, the cross-binding epitopes. So theoretically, that in increases the sensitivity and specificity as well. Yeah. And the, the challenge for the MMIA is the cross-reactivity that you need some analysis to cut off. I'm sorry, I didn't really uh, hear. I mean, the, the non-specificity that you might far from MMIA that is the, the challenge? Yeah, so it's, it's, re it's reduced um, with MMIA relative to the ELISA. Um, you would have to find the correct solution, um, but based off of what we've seen um, for SARS-2 infections and SARS-2 vaccines, you can run a serum dilution at one to 16,000 and still detect antibodies, which greatly dilutes any cross-reactive or non-specific antibodies out of the, the, the serum. Okay, thank you. Very impressive. Yeah. If the audience have any questions, you can raise your hand, please. Are there any questions? Oh, okay. I, have the, I have the question about the monkeypox, because I think that in the future, we, we may use the vaccine to, to protect our population from, from monkeypox. For in your production, in the slide, you show that you're going to have uh, monkeypox panels. So what kind of antibody that you're going to measure? Is this for diagnostic or neutralizing antibody to monitor the activity of the neutralizing antibody against the monkeypox? Um, I think right now we only have binding. We don't have neutralizing, but that is a possibility in the future. You, it, again, you just have to change the secondary reagent from, from the assay. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Okay, if no questions, thank you very much, Mr. Sterling.